So uh, first, thanks for having me and showing up and listening to what I hope will be an exciting talk. I really find this type of stuff very interesting. Doesn't mean everybody else does. Um, so about me, I uh, started out as a mathematician, physicist, and then I turned into a consultant for primarily government work working at a company called Booz Allen Hamilton. So that's kind of where my interest in things like big data and Hadoop came from is working as a mathematician and physicist, you work with data a lot. Uh, actually, one of my examples of big data comes from the physics world. And then as I was a consultant within uh, primarily the government sector, there's a lot of data that needs to get analyzed. So we started out doing some looking into things like Hadoop uh, at my last job. Uh, also a graduate student uh, in computer science at uh, University of Nebraska, Omaha. So focusing in machine learning, data mining type activities. So another one of the reasons why I'm interested and, and uh, know a little bit about Hadoop. And currently a software engineer at a company called uh, Sojourn. So most people probably haven't heard of us unless you've uh, done work in display advertising or the travel industry. So our focus is uh, display advertising for the uh, travel industry. So a lot of machine learning, uh, big data type problems there. So lots of really fun and interesting things. So introduction to Hadoop. Now, I'm just going to warn you, Hadoop is kind of like this big nebulous thing, and it's fairly complicated. And the first time you look at it, it's, it's hard to make heads or tails because Hadoop, um, started out as an elephant. Uh, it was the, the creator of Hadoop. Uh, his son's toy elephant was, I believe, named Hadoop, and so that's how Hadoop came to be. At the beginning, Hadoop was just really uh, one or two things. It was the file system. It was MapReduce. That's about it. And now it's uh, this high-level Apache project that includes all of these different uh, sub-projects and related projects. So this is actually. There's still more out there that interacts with Hadoop and uh, works with Hadoop, but these are kind of all of the, the big high-level projects. But we're not going to cover most of those up there. We're probably only going to cover MapReduce, HBase, and HDFS, and at a very high level. So this was my first impression when I first saw all of that, was just like, how does this work together? And sometimes this is what it feels like deb debugging um, Hadoop instances, uh, like the weekend I spent just in the office trying to f figure out a very minor thing, and then it's just a, a configuration issue. Uh, I just didn't push that lever right there. I found that out hours later. So at a very, very, very high level, um, most Hadoop clusters, this is going to be a multi-node cluster. You're going to have um, two major parts. You're going to have the file system, and you're going to have the compute system. And ignore HBase for, for now, I'll get to that. But the file system is where you store files. Uh, so that's the Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS. And so that's down here. And there's some, uh, you'll see a very, very common pattern. Uh, over here you have a master, and over here you have slave nodes. So that is, um, you'll see that, that common pattern over and over again in Hadoop. So in HDFS, that's called your name node, is where you go for your initial uh, looking things up. And then the data actually shows up on the data nodes. Similarly, MapReduce is scalable distributed batch processing. So same exact concept is I submit uh, jobs, which actually then get executed uh, using the task tracker on the slave nodes. So you have the job tracker, which is I submit something. That breaks it up into little tasks, puts it out into the compute nodes. The thing that is beautiful about uh, the way that MapReduce does things is instead of trying to move data around throughout the network, even if you have a nice um, high capacity network, you can quickly eat up that uh, internode bandwidth. So MapReduce, the idea behind it is let's have the data live on the same node as where we're computing it at. So that's the beauty of MapReduce. We'll get into that a little bit more. Lastly, HBase is related to all of this, but um, 
came a little bit later. So with MapReduce, it's great for things like batch jobs, but it did very poorly if I wanted to, let's say, have millisecond, uh, around the order of a millisecond type uh, access to just random data. So that's where HBase comes in, is low latency, random access to large amounts of data. Now, at this point, you may be asking yourself, what is Hadoop useful for? Uh, so one of the big things that a lot of companies will use it for is this whole ETL type process. So I want to take data in, um, do some extraction, do some transforming, do some data normalization, whatever you want to uh, do, and then put it into my other system. So if you went back to one of the previous slides, you'd s that, that original I think third slide in, you'd see something called Scoop. That's actually a tool that somebody built to um, take data, transform it, and get it in and out of relational databases. So that's one big use case is, uh, is basically preparing data and you know, extracting data from relational databases. Data mining, so taking large amounts of data and looking for interesting facts. Uh, so you're, if you probably guessed, the advertising interesting would be our advertising industry would be very interested in stuff like that. Uh, data warehousing, another very good use case because it can, Hadoop can scale to petabytes of data. So you just want to go and dump a bunch of data somewhere and uh, maybe do some analytics on it later. That's really good for it. So in general, Hadoop is kind of that sphere of big data use cases. So what do we mean by big data? Um, Generally, gross simplification, because there is no fine line between you know, medium data, small data, ISO hasn't gone as far as my knowledge and standardized what big data means. But I put together some comparisons of different uh, openly available data sources. So let's say you wanted to dump all of Wikipedia. I think this was just the English pages, so not all the history, but just basically the English version of Wikipedia. Compressed, that's about nine gigabytes. So I'm sure everyone in this room probably has enough room on their laptop or probably their phone to, to actually take that and put it into memory or put it into the, their device. I might not, I've filled mine up with songs, I think. But uh, OpenStreetMap, uh, if you're not familiar with OpenStreetMap, basically it's, think of Google Maps, but it's like uh, Wikipedia, it's open data. People go and put their, you know, if I want to put that, I'm on ga at Gallup right now, maybe there's a gas station, I mark that in there. Uh, the whole uh, data dump from there is 19 gigabytes in uh, Google protocol buffers format, so it's um, still 19 gigabytes, relatively small. So I don't think we're, we're out, not out of the space of relational databases quite yet. Uh, common crawl, so if you go to Amazon and you look up some of their uh, open data sources, Common Crawl is, um, I don't know how far back it goes, but it's a collection of uh, websites, basically a crawl index, so the equivalent of Google, but very outdated. That's about 81 terabytes. Now we're starting to get into the realm of big data. You're probably not running you know, this on a single machine anymore. Uh, same place, you can go Amazon, 1,000 uh, genomes, and I don't know what that data is because I'm not a you know, bioinformatics person. But that data set that you can find on Amazon, about 200 terabytes. So you're now starting to get into the, OK, this is, this is getting big data. And now, Large Hadron Collider, told you my background is physics. Uh, this is generating 15 petabytes annually. You're now definitely, uh, even though you're looking at you know, sub, you know, quantum level particles, it's big data. I kind of like that. So this is the point where once you get into the petabyte range, you might be able to get a, pet, uh, a relational database to handle it, but not without a lot of work. So this is what I could find. Just I wanted to do a basis of comparison to see, um, as far as a relational database uh, versus something like Hadoop, they're not necessarily the same thing. I really get annoyed when people confuse the two and try to say that you know Hadoop's trying to replace that. That's not at all what they're trying to do. They're different spaces, but if you're looking at the comparison of very large, and I just went Postgres type uh, installations, uh, these are all 
I think pretty heavily, like the Yahoo instance, for example, is very heavily modified. They took the stock Postgres, modified it to go up to about two petabytes. So that's still, that's a still pretty big uh, database right there for relational terms. Uh, IRS reportedly 150 terabytes. So these are just examples of kind of stretching the upper end of what a relational database is capable of uh, storing and processing. I don't know many details behind that, but I'm also guessing that they're disabling. Oh, they yeah, they're they're probably right. Like I know that the the Yahoo I read about that instance, and it's a very heavily modified. I don't think that they're using a lot of things like indexes and joins and things like that. Um, Maybe that's what they're doing. I don't. That's why I wish I knew a little bit more on. I just got the figures and I didn't get the the engineering behind it. But typically, what you'll see in a relational database is that, you know, once it gets up to a certain point, you start you stop using some of the nice features of the database in order to get it to scale. Now, this isn't necessarily a NoSQL talk because there's lots of really cool. That's more of like what HBase does. That's a whole other talk in and of itself of the different NoSQL solutions out there and which ones are good for you know, scalability and trade-off. But the idea is if you're just wanting to store raw amounts of data, after a while you're probably better off not putting it in, in something like uh, Postgres or, well, Oracle would probably disagree. They, they, you, if you pay enough, they'll store it for you. Um, now if you look conversely, the large Hadoop installations. So, Quantcast, I believe, is like a, a quantitative financial type company. Yahoo and Facebook, probably heard of them. Uh, Yahoo, I believe, is it's either Yahoo or Facebook. I couldn't get up-to-date figures on Facebook, um, what their cluster is currently at. But those are, I think, some of the two of the largest clusters out there. So you're talking 4,000 nodes, hundreds of petabytes. Now, the thing about both of those is that they're running multiple clusters internally, don't have all the details on that, just whatever they've released to the public. Uh, so you don't have to run that many nodes, obviously, to get Hadoop to work. Um, I mean, literally, you can run it in a VM if you want. But this gives you an idea of the scalability. More recent versions of Hadoop uh, have been released to uh, get it to scale to much larger capacities. So that was just the kind of high level, you know, uh, 30,000 feet foot overview of, of Hadoop. Now, here's next, uh, like I said, the three things I want to talk about, HDFS, MapReduce, and uh, HBase. HDFS is the file system. So coming back to that picture that I've shown you earlier, HDFS is basically it was, uh, it came from the Google file system. So a lot of Hadoop uh, came out of papers published by Google. So I have a, I think I have a slide in the backup that shows almost, you know, one for one. Uh, here's a Google paper, then here's the Hadoop implementation. This was based off of the Google file system. Pretty much takes most of the com concepts and applies them. So the things that are good to know about HDFS is it's not your, it looks like a little like, like a Linux, uh, Unix type file system, has some of the ca same command line uh, options, but it's not quite the same, and so you could easily get uh, messed up by treating that. Now, one of the things uh, to point out is when it says optimize for high throughput, not low latency, uh, one, of, one of the things about, um, if you're talking the file system here, and tied to that bottom one, not optimized for small, small files and random reads. It's very common in HDFS to be storing files that are gigabytes, um, you know, definitely megabytes, if not gigabytes in, in capacity. The default block size in HDFS, uh, normally, I think default is 64 megabytes, but it's you know 128 or more is, is very common. So the, the thing to note about HDFS is that you can't just use it as a you know, drop-in replacement for your traditional file system. So it really, really is poor at handling small files. So if I put in a bunch of you know, two megabyte files on there, 
it's going to take up the 64 megabytes or whatever my block size is. So it's very inefficient at that. The other thing not indicated on here is that if you're building up an HDFS cluster, you automatically have to uh, factor in the default replication factor of three. So every piece of data, you're going to see it three different times, um, again, by default. So this kind of gives you an example of how you would interface with it. And again, anyone who's done some Linux, Unix type command line stuff, it's going to look similar enough. So uh, except that it has this like annoying little, you know, you have to type in HDFS, DFS, hyphen, and then the normal command for the most part, it's pretty similar. So the first one is just making a directory. The second one is a recursive, uh, removing recursively all that data. Uh, the third one is actually getting data from the remote system, putting it to the local. The interesting part of this then is, so doing an LS on this particular directory. Uh, if you're familiar with Unix, Linux type uh, output, you're going to notice it looks very similar. A few exceptions. Uh, first of all, even though files might have that little X for executable, doesn't mean anything because you can't execute things on HDFS. Uh, it's not how it works. So that's one of the reasons why I said previous slide not POSIX compliance, compliant. Uh, that three that you see right here is the number of times it's replicated. So maybe for whatever reason you might want to up that um, to a higher number, but that's kind of the default setting. That's actually what makes HDFS really um, good at fault tolerance. Or, so the idea is that you build, uh, we saw previously 4,000, 2,000 node clusters. Good chance that during a relatively large job, you're going to have a failure of a hard drive somewhere. Uh, that's actually very common uh, when they do these uh, you know, large jobs that at least one disk is going to fail. So the idea is failure is common, replicate it out, failure happens, the Hadoop system automatically figures out what to do, how to reallocate, uh, all that fun stuff. Uh, also, what you're seeing right here, uh, which we'll get to a little bit later in the MapReduce, is actually the output of a MapReduce job. Uh, so these are, if I went into a typical MapReduce output folder, I'd see something like this. Uh, each one of these part slat, you know, hyphen R000 is, uh, I could have multiple of those if there's multiple reducers, which we haven't talked about yet, but bear that in mind. Now, when we talk about storing stuff on HDFS, uh, there's a few popular file formats. You can use, and this is fairly common to use, uh, comma separated values, tab separated values, and that's still very common, uh, and just have relatively large files. However, uh, when it comes to big data, when you have large amounts of data, little efficiencies can gain you a lot. So that's why some of the other formats uh, that you see up there are a little bit more efficient. So Avro is, again, one of those top level Hadoop projects that uh, you basically define a schema and it's a, you define the schema in JSON and then write data, it stores it in a binary uh, format, actually very similar to protocol buffers and thrift. Uh, sequence file, that's what Hadoop uses internally to write the output of MapReduce jobs. RC file is a column-based uh, storage format. Uh, all of them kind of have their different pros and cons and why you might want to use them. Some are better at or more efficient. Some are easier to do schema migrations, things like that. But in general, when you're doing Hadoop processing, you're going to see probably one of these file formats coupled with some kind of compression. Uh, now, the choice of compression, which again, we'll get to a little bit in MapReduce on how jobs are done. Uh, some of these compressions have different trade-offs. Uh, for example, bzip uh, is splittable, which means if I have a really big bzip file, I can split it apart and process it uh, using different map and reduce jobs. Whereas gzip by default is not. Snappy, 
uh, another one of those Google compression algorithms. Uh, it's major, uh, one of the major reasons it's used is that it's not as efficient in terms of compression, but it has a good trade-off in terms of actually decompression, uh, the, the processing power. Okay. And by the way, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to stop me. So what we just talked about there, that was just a very high level overview of HDFS. That's the big file, big data storage uh, that HBase, MapReduce are all built on top of. So now. I have a question before mm -hmm. we move on from HDFS. Mm -hmm. the, you have your little HDFS URIs with the host in it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those hosts? Well, nn.example.com, uh, that one is meaningless. But that's actually pointing to, so the NN in that, sorry, I wasn't trying to be uh, snarky, but the, the NN portion of it is pointing to the name node. So I'm sorry if I kind of glossed over that. And there's one of those? Yes, and so um, now you're thinking to yourself, single point of failure. Uh, maybe you weren't thinking that, but it is the single. Now, <laughs> now you're. Yeah. No, but the, the name node is where uh, in the HDFS file system, and kind of just going back here, so the name node is where you go to get information about where files are stored. So it's like a big directory structure. And in general, that is the single point of failure for HDFS. And that's why, while we normally say commodity hardware, uh, it means different things for slave and master. You probably want a beefed up um, server for your master that's a little bit more reliable. In later versions of MapReduce, uh, I think MapReduce 2.0, they've actually come out with a highly available name node. But because of the way the name node works is it's not as simple as just using something like uh, you know, high availability Linux. You can't just do that. Uh, so that's, they've got their ways of doing that. But in general, the name node and the job tracker, and when we get into HBase, the, the master node, are on pretty hefty um, hardware. Whereas the data nodes, eh, if they fail, they fail. Now, I don't know if I answered a question or just, OK. So yeah, the URL is basically your master. Yep, so that's actually where you point it to the master. The master then goes, uh, does the lookup. Now, the one thing, and I found this out kind of the hard way through trial and error, is your client needs to be able to talk to every single one of those name nodes. So that was one of the things with, you know, if you have a firewall set up, it's not enough for a client just to be able to access the name node. It's actually physically going and retrieving chunks from each of the data nodes. Uh, so things you learn by trial and error or reading the book beforehand, I guess. Sir, do you have a question? Um, are the, when you have the, the large files, are they, I know you said they're like replicated, but mm. are the files, if you have a 10 gigabyte file or mm. 20 gigabyte, is that split among multiple disks or is the entire file on one physical disk? I, this is one of those things I would look up just to be sure, but I believe it's just block level re replication. So when you look up something uh, using the name node, um, it stores the locations of the blocks. So I don't think there's any guarantee that you're going to have a full, um, I think that it's possible that it, like especially larger files would be split across multiple data nodes. That's true. But it's one of those things I'd have to look up to be sure. So I. I, sorry, that's not. Uh, oh. oh, so that actually, so when you talk the map keys and the values, um, that'll get to in hopefully just a minute or two. Um, so, any more questions or comments? Okay. So now kind of a good segue into the, the key values and how MapReduce works. So MapReduce is, OK, I've seen some of the faces here from like the dynamic users group. Anyone here familiar with uh, some functional programming? OK. I mean, you're in a Java users group, but you can admit it. You're among friends. Um, this is actually where MapReduce came from, was from a functional paradigm. So you see uh, in a lot of more functionally oriented languages, you'll see this map and reduce 
functions, which the map is pretty simple. I have a collection of stuff. You know, it could be a list if you want to put it in those terms. And all I do is I take a function and I apply it to every single thing in that list. So that's the map phase. And the output is a key value pair. Now going to how, map or how the MapReduce Hadoop uh, uh, actually handles that, sequence files is how it outputs them. And it tries to keep those local to, uh, if it's on, if it computed data from a data node, it's going to try to keep it there. But that's not always easy, because once you get into the reduce mode, there's no guarantees, because that's the, the very large uh, short, sort and, uh, shuffle phase, which will basically say, OK, I'm going to take all the keys and sort them. So all the keys uh, are in the same spot. So that actually does involve some moving data around. You can't help that, because not, unless Within maybe some fringe cases, there might not need as much moving around. But this is one of the cases where you actually need to do that. So the reduce phase takes all the keys, uh, or collects all the data with common keys, and does something to it. Uh, so this might be a sum, a count, an average would be something that you would do. Uh, and like I said here, it does try to minimize moving data, moving data between nodes as much as possible. But sometimes that's not always the case. So you know, different programming languages have different hello world versions. Word count is the hello world of MapReduce. So the idea is I have a corpus, which is a fancy way of saying I got a bunch of documents. And I want to count the number of times each word occurs. And so for the sake of what we're talking about here, let's just assume that we don't have to worry about punctuation. We don't have to worry about silly stuff. We just have a bunch of words, OK? Uh, first, I'm going to just show you versions from the Java version of this. And then um, after we get done with the Java version of this, I'll show you some ways to avoid having to ever program MapReduce. When I first started working with MapReduce, I was, it was actually a lot of it was uh, in one of my graduate classes. So we're reading all these papers on MapReduce, and you just, it seems very cumbersome. And then I find out later that other people thought it was cumbersome and found ways around it. So this, all of this is really saying right here, the really important part of this is that if you're looking up towards the top where we're saying class map extends mapper, the long writable, the text, the text, and the int writable, all that is saying is the key is a long writable. In this case, we don't really care what the map key is, what the input key is. Uh, all we really care about is the text. And then the output to the reducer. And there doesn't always have to be a reducer. A lot of the times, there's a lot of cool things that you can do without ever touching a reducer. But the output, the key value pair, is a key, uh, which is text, in this case, a word and an int writable, which in this case is a number. And all of this stuff right here is doing is just saying, we're going to take that, we're going to tokenize it. So take a line of data, tokenize it into words, um, then go through all the tokens. And all I'm doing is just emitting a word and the count of one. I don't know why that's one is the word, not the number. Um, but anyways, that's really all that the mapper is doing, is just going through and a lot of code just to, to say that. Um, the reducer, similar type thing, is I'm telling you what kind of key am I looking for uh, as the input. So it's a text. The, the value is an int writable. The output is text and another int writable. Because all we're doing is just summing up the counts and throwing it back out. So from here, all I'm doing is iterating all over the values and then outputting the sum. Okay, Again, a lot of code, but that's all it's really saying is that I'm counting up all the values, outputting it. And then lastly, this throws it all together. And I'm going over this rather quickly uh, for kind of a reason, is to actually you know, understand what each one of those is doing probably take a little bit of time. And it's not important 
concepts are probably more important right now. But all I'm doing right here is I'm tying it together. So I'm putting together a configuration. I'm telling you how I want that data input and how I want it output. Uh, so this is actually where Hadoop can get very confusing too because you might have text input, you might have uh, protocol buffers input, you might have XML input. It could be you know, pretty much anything. Same thing with the outputs. So this is where writing MapReduce jobs by hand, or by Java, I should say, gets really complex really quickly. So all of that was just basically to count some words, OK? Uh, and this is just tying it together, saying there's the mapper, there's the reducer class. Um, this doesn't even tie in something more complex, like if I want to have multiple map and reduce phases that I want to do uh, branching and things like that. So this gets me to at least my problems with MapReduce. Uh, it's very cumbersome API. Uh, plus, they decided uh, the Hadoop community has not been good on stability in terms of recent, well, recent releases they've gotten a little bit better, but they've changed things around. The APIs are not always the most intuitive. It's uh, uh, kind of difficult to read. Uh, and it's too low level for most things. Like if you, for example, came from like a, you know, a SQL type uh, background, you'd look at this and say, well, how would I do an average? How would I do a count? How would I do these very basic things I can already do in SQL today? Uh, I have to write a MapReduce job in Java to do that, which comes to the last one is, you know, some people, I'm get, given that you're a Java users group, probably enjoy or are good at writing Java. But if I'm like a data analyst, which is one of the big use cases of Hadoop, I probably either don't know Java, or if I do, I'm probably not that great at it. I'm not saying all data analysts are bad at it, but in my experience, uh, working with a lot of scientists, a lot of data uh, folks, those people, frankly, write a lot of bad code, because that's not what they specialize in. They specialize in other things. So this is where MapReduce is great, uh, but it's really a low-level abstraction. And if I can help it, I never, ever, ever, ever want to write any more MapReduce code ever again. The best way I can describe it is it's kind of like if you're using a data database, are you ever going to go and have to write uh, implementation of a B star tree? Probably not, because someone's already done it, and I just can deal with the abstraction of putting things into an index. Uh, same thing with MapReduce jobs. Uh, so I'm going to just show you examples of the same thing. There's minor differences in, in how things were implemented, but it's the same basic word count concept. Uh, one is with Hive, which is an SQL-like query language. So they couldn't implement like all of uh, the SQL standard, but they use a lot of the same keywords. So if you're a you know, if you're a database person, you come to Hadoop and you pick up Hive, you're going to be in pretty familiar territory, though there's some gotchas in there. Pig, so let's say you're more like me. Uh, I come from a programming background. One of my favorite languages is Python. So I like these procedural languages rather than like declarative SQL. Uh, Pig is a procedural high level language for creating Hadoop workflows. Uh, one of my languages of choice, if I'm going to be uh, uh, doing some like ETL type stuff because it integrates great if I needed to do add-on stuff in Java, Python. Uh, they even have stuff now for Groovy, Ruby, and JavaScript. Um, cascading, the best way I can describe it is it's somewhere between MapReduce and something like Pig. So it's still pretty high level, but it allows for some workflow. Uh, it allow, it's, it's basically, if you've done Unix, done some pipe stuff, it's kind of like that. It's based on the concept of piping data from one point into the next. And then lastly, this is one I've uh, recently got into, is Cascalog. Uh, it's a closure-based query language, which is loosely based on data log, which is a sub, uh, it's based on prolog, the, the syntax. So it's more. Um, I guess first order logic uh, predicate 
our first order predicate logic. So all of them are, are different choices. So let's look Hive. Um, now you notice some things that, if you're familiar with SQL, that you're not going to see in your typical SQL, which is lateral view, explode. Those two I'm not 100% um, uh, well versed in all of the dialects of SQL, but those are probably things you're going to see, not going to see. Uh, and basically, what explode does is takes uh, a tuple, a, a bunch of different values, and flattens them out. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty, I mean, you could probably just by, if you know SQL, you could read this and see what it's trying to do, is I'm taking the table, which is input. Hive has this nice abstraction layer that I can pretty much take any input and, um, and make it into something that looks like a table. So like, uh, but here's where all the, the, the gotchas I can talk about. One of the gotchas is that most databases are, uh, they validate on the data being written. Hive, just by its nature, is validating on read. So that might cause some kind of mismatch and some issues. But in general, um, we've used Hive a lot. You can run into some performance issues from people who might come from a more relational database background and try to do similar things like uh, one of the things you'll, you'll learn very quickly when working with big data is joins can be very painful because they're computationally expensive. Um, so if you do things with, in the wrong order or, um, you know, basically Hive doesn't really have a very good query optimization, though it's, it's getting a lot better. And I'd love to talk about that, um, some of the cool stuff they're doing in that world, but this talk would go on for hours. Um, pig. So with pig, um, pretty, I personally really, really like pig. And I was supposed to, I'm hoping to give a talk at the dynamic uh, languages group on pig and Cascalog next month. But pig is, unlike SQL, it's not declarative. It's, it's uh, this procedural language. So you're basically going through and saying, at each stage, I'm defining a set of relations. So in this case, I'm basically saying my input li lines, load them from this HDFS location called temp the internet. Uh, and then pig is kind of nice um, in that the philosophy behind the pig projects is that pigs eat anything. So I could say that line is a character array, or I could just not do anything with it and just not tell, not tell pig what it is, um, which is really kind of nice if you're doing ETL type stuff where Either you might not have a predefined schema, or you might just it might not be worth it to, to, to state that. So the next thing down is it's going through, it's, uh, it's doing this for each looping through and generating this list of words. So that's what this, it has a tokenize, tokenizes the line, but then that has a collection, and then flattens it out, similar to what you saw with the explode in the hive query. Um, then you go through and you do the grouping um, and the counting. And then you store it back out to, and I wouldn't even necessarily need to store it back out if I didn't want to. A lot of the times, I um, could dump it out onto the screen if I'm doing kind of interactive stuff. But looking at this, then comparing it back to the Java version, you know, if you look at this and this, a lot less, a uh, lot easier to work with. Group by, flatten, order, a lot easier to understand than, than trying to reduce it down to the MapReduce paradigm. OK, probably going to just gloss over this unless someone wants to go through in, in detail to see. Again, the reason I'm putting up the examples is just to kind of give you a comparison of what uh, this looks like versus uh, full up MapReduce. As you can tell, it's a decent amount of code somewhere between the full MapReduce program and something like pig or hive. And maybe just to point out one or two things in this, uh, cascading works on the ideas of sinks and sources. So the idea of uh, my sync scheme, and it says text line fields, and it tells me what those fields are. So it's, uh, cascading is really working on the idea of putting together a pipeline. And it has some of the, 
it doesn't have the the reduce as as a fundamental uh, operator. It uses group by, it uses each, it uses every. Um, I haven't used cascading as much, more than just like a few toy examples, but it's good if you probably need to write some Java code that has a complex workflow, and for some reason you didn't want to do it in Pig. So unless there's any questions, I'm going to go on to the next. Um, just because I'm a Python guy, I wanted to put the Python version of this, because this is Python version of cascading. This is probably easier to read than the Java one. It's doing the same thing because it's the same underlying libraries, or the same underlying concepts, I should say. But I put together a map, um, and then I just basically, this is my pipeline down here. Input, split words, group by, and then output. So a lot easier to read at the very least. Um, and then lastly, this is the Casca log example, and I'm not going to speak too much to it other than just to show uh, another way to skin the cat. And so I just wanted to, the entire point of those was just to get across that MapReduce, that's fine, it's great for writing fundamental al algorithms, but if you're lucky, you never have to touch it. Um, so now I'm going to pause for a second. Any questions on anything before I move on to HBase? I know that I'm covering like a lot of material, um, so I just want to make sure if anyone has any questions. Go ahead. All right. So HBase, it's built on Hadoop, but it's in more, now you're starting to compare more of apples to or, or apples to apples than apples to oranges, because Hadoop versus your traditional relational databases, database really isn't a fair comparison because they're built to do two different things. HBase is a little bit more um, in that same realm. It's, it's at least trying to compare things that are trying to accomplish the same type of task, and by that is uh, real-time access to random data. Uh, so about HBase, it's NoSQL, which I always think is odd because NoSQL, I can still query the database with something like Hive, which is an SQL variant. So I, that whole buzzword to me is a, a little bit misleading. No SQL, really what you're meaning is it's a not a relational database. It doesn't follow the, it's not strictly ACID compliant. It doesn't necessarily follow all of the, the features of a relational database. It's distributed by default. This is one of the reasons why if you're using HBase, it's probably because of that. Um, distributing a, a traditional relational database is a little bit, can be a little bit complex, uh, whereas distributing HBase, that's what it does by default, and scaling it is a lot easier. It's versioned, what that means is that each piece of data you put in HBase, you, you, can, you have the ability to store, store multiple versions of that data. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I think the default value is three versions, but uh, if you're going back to the use case of something like uh, web table where they're storing uh, crawls of web pages, you might want to store a few versions back for various reasons. Each piece of data is also natively time stamped, so that's something also. And then uh, they're all, it's a columnar database, but not necessarily in the way that um, there's some intricacies there, but basically. It's a very, very, very big key value um, storage me mechanism is the best way to put it. So each column is a, its own key value. Now, if we're talking about actual use cases, uh, the common use case and the first use case, going back to how everything uh, in Hadoop, not everything, but a lot of things in Hadoop were stolen or based on Google technology. Uh, so Google uh, Bigtable, is the original, is the equivalent to HBase. And the use case that they had for it at Google originally was the web crawl table. So as their key, they would have a reverse ordered URL, so com.cnn.com, uh, and then they would have, you know, maybe they have anchor text or, you know, whatever uh, they stored in the actual values. Uh, but that was one of the big uh, use cases. Recently, Facebook, with uh, their large-scale uh, messaging platform built on HBase, 
Uh, sensor data collection, which was one that I'm kind of my last job, I did a lot with uh, sensor data and sensor data collection. I think this is one of the big use cases. Um, also analytics. So the idea that maybe there's actually a product out there called uh, Open Time Series Database, which is built on HBase, but the idea is you're collecting all sorts of different metrics all the time. So maybe it's metrics from your web servers, maybe it's web analytics, maybe it's uh, could be physical sensors uh, collecting temperature. You want to collect that, but you want to store it in such a way that you have real-time access to any single piece of data. So how HBase does this, and this is a very gross high-level overview, and uh, I really wish I had a better, um, I had a picture of this, but I couldn't find a good one in time. But HBase at its very high level is, uh, actually I'm just going to skip ahead because this might make more sense. At a high level, HBase, this is the data model. You have a row key. So that row key could, um, it's actually just an uninterpreted uh, array of bytes, but you could think of it as something like com dot google dot you know whatever would be an example of a row key if I was let's say crawling the web uh, it could be pretty much anything and I wish uh, don't have an example off my top of my head right now but I'll get back to that column family that one's always the one that is a little bit confusing at first because a column family the best way to describe that is it's just how HBase stores things physically so Column family is a way to store multiple related columns. Uh, and so on the disk, the actual physical storage, the type of parameters that you control are things like time to live. So in HBase, I could set uh, a piece of data to expire after you know, two days. So be, again, if we're looking at something like analytics, that'd be a very good use case. Uh, it controls how many versions. It controls what type of compression. And in, controls whether or not I use these advanced data structures called bloom filters. So column families, the best way to describe them is just they're a way of um, columns are stored together on disk. It's just a way of configuring them as a, a group rather than on a per column basis. Your column, I talked about the whole key value store thing. So HBase really all it is is a collection of key value pairs. A column, that's the name. Uh, a column is given a name, that's the key. The value is the value. So each piece of data in HBase, looking at this model right here, has a row key, column family, column, timestamp, and a value. So that is what they call a cell in HBase. So each piece of data, um, I mean, that's pretty much what data in HBase looks like. It's very, very rudimentary uh, and doesn't necessarily work well for a, lo a lot of use cases, but will work well for some. So now I'm going to go back. When we talked, so hopefully that gives you a little more context. Uh, so each row, so indexed by that row key that we talked about, uh, is split across multiple different regions. So again, think back to that earlier slide when we talked about Hadoop architecture kind of going off of a, a master-slave arch architecture. Uh, in HDFS, you have a name node, you have a data node. Uh, in MapReduce, you have a job tracker and a task tracker. In HBase, you'll have a master server and a bunch of region servers. So each region is hosted by a single region server. It's actually all backed by HDFS too. Um, so that's how it kind of plays well with the Hadoop ecosystem. But I believe there are modifications where it can work on other file systems. Uh, you could actually download HBase today and work off your local file system. Probably don't want to do that for a production instance, of course. Uh, I think you can use Amazon S3, and there's a few other distributed file storage uh, systems you can use. The cool thing about HBase, as opposed to some NoSQL solutions, uh, a lot of NoSQL solutions get bad press because of how they approach consistency. So the idea is uh, you can have consistency, um, availability, 
or partition tolerance, pick two. Uh, HBase uh, favors consistency and partition tolerance at the cost of availability. So one of the things that HBase does that some other systems, uh, it's, not consist it's not eventually consistent. Um, if you're talking on a single row action, uh, that's atomic, which means if I go and make a write to a, a single row, it's going to be atomic. No one else is going to be able to write to that until I'm finished. So that's actually one of the things that a lot of people um, like about HBase. I think Cassandra has a similar uh, consistency model. But it makes it nice for things like web analytics, where you might be doing a lot of uh, counter incrementing, things like that. Uh, So the last thing I just wanted to say before moving on to another slide is um, HBase then how it handles the, so you have uh, master and then you have a bunch of different region servers. The rows are split across different regions, but the one thing that HBase does that is a very useful feature, it keeps all of those rows sorted so that let's say um, we we're just sorting like last names. So if it's if I, my, my last name, Hermans, would be right next to my wife's uh, last or name because if it was sorted by you know, last name, we're all in the same spot. So that means that if I wanted to do, let's say, some kind of genealogical ana uh, analysis of my family members, I could do a scan over related rows because uh, they're all stored right next to each other. So that's actually an efficient operation. Okay. So now, here is one of the important things that can really get me irritated uh, when people start talking about things like NoSQL is the idea that NoSQL is, a, in, is going to be a complete replacement for your, your relational database. Well, this differs based on the type of technology, but let's just do the, the comparison between HBase and a traditional relational database. The first thing about HBase, horizontal scaling. If you are going to be doing HBase, that's probably why you're doing it, is because you want something that scales. Uh, there's actually a really good flow chart that I saw that I was going to put in here, but I cited against it. But it basically started with, are you Google? No. Are you Facebook? No. Then just use a database. Um, which is <laughs> kind of tongue in cheek, but I think a lot of people uh, seem to get this. When we talk scaling, we're not just talking, going back earlier in the talk, you know, a few gigabytes or even a few terabytes. Uh, unless you're really talking terabytes to petabytes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, sacrifice some of the wonderful things you get in a relational solution, like uh, joins, indexes, data types. Uh, that actually can be <laughs> very frustrating working with HBase because uh, uh, so the writer writes to it from Java, but then I'm using something like Pig. They might have written something uh, using like a long, but it, I don't necessarily know that. So I have to tell it that it's a long and then cast it to it. Sometimes it works. Uh, sometimes there's some issues. Maybe someone made a change to the code and then just decided that instead of writing it out as a long writable, they wanted to write it out as a string. Uh, so it's. HBase really doesn't care what you put in it. It's all bytes to it, which is kind of frustrating at time, times. So it's not always the best choice for that type of things. Uh, also, it doesn't have transactions like a traditional database. Uh, the closest it has is that it has atomic access across a single row. So if I was doing a single row update, it's atomic. But uh, if I wanted to update one row and then update a related row, no guarantees. Uh, the other thing, if you came from a relational database world, they probably taught you about you know, third normal form of uh, normalization. All of that kind of goes out the window when you go into something like HBase. It's really meant to be these really, really wide, potentially sparse uh, data structures. So my opinion, you sacrifice a lot by going to something like HBase, but what you gain is if you really are Twitter or Google or Facebook or, you know, I mentioned one of my other use cases, sensor data collection, 
this could be the right tool for you, but don't go out and say, we're gonna move everything to HBase without realizing that you're gonna lose a lot in the process. Um, also, talking about HDFS versus HBase, because we talked earlier about MapReduce, and we talked about storing files on HDFS. So, what advantages or differences is there to just storing all of my data in this one big file on HDFS versus having it in HBase? Well, the first thing is, if your biggest use case is batch processing, probably doesn't make sense to put it in HBase because just the way that HBase is built, um, even if you're storing the exact same data, it's sorted the exact same way, it's gonna be about four to five times slower than just HDFS. And that has to do with um, basically just the architectural differences between the two. Even though it's all stored on HDFS, uh, it's having to go through H, uh, HBase's uh, master, finding the rows, all this complicated stuff. Uh, but basically, if you're doing batch processing, just stick to throwing files out on HDFS. Uh, if you actually need random access, that's when you're probably going to, wanting to use HBase. Um, also, if you want to do small records, uh, I think HBase's H block size by default is like 64 kilobytes, so it's really pretty decent at storing small records. Um, whereas HDFS, if I put a 64 kilobyte uh, file in there, it's still going to take up the 128 uh, megabytes of space just because that's the smallest block it allocates. And then lastly, the number of records, um, due to limitations in HDFS, uh, I think you can only get about maybe 100 million files in the average Hadoop cluster. Uh, which is still a lot, but if you're talking, uh, you know, sensor data collection, if you're talking websites where you potentially have billions of records, that's where you probably want to use something like this. And so I'm going to try to wrap it up here soon because I'm, I think that there's a lot of stuff that was covered and I think there's just a, trying to give you a feel for, the, for how this works. Uh, so HBase has a shell, it's actually a JRuby <coughs> base shell. And right here, what I'm just kind of showing you is creating and describing a table and how things work. So again, this is just to kind of give you a, a good feeling for how things work in HBase. It's not like, I, like you're seeing up here. You're not defining data types. You're not saying this is of type, you know, this is a character, this is a date time. You don't have that. Um, but you do get to set things like compression, number of versions, things like that. And I am going to go really fast through this uh, last little code examples unless somebody wants me to pause. But this is how you get data from HBase from Java. Okay? This is how you put data from Java. The thing that I want to pause a little bit on is this idea of a scan, not because the code is that interesting, but it's because of the concept. The idea is that in HBase, uh, you can't do queries because you, you can either get one instance or you can do a scan over row keys. And that is why it's so important in traditional, there's, there's all these books related to traditional database relational schema design. In HBase, it's all about the row keys. Um, so in particular, HBase schemas there's just a, a little bit of, um, you have to use smart row keys instead of, uh, in a normal database, your key might be one, two, three, four, five, six, just an integer incremental key. Uh, those are actually really bad in HBase because of the way that it's stored. Uh, it causes a lot of data to, since they're stored next to each other, cause a lot of data to just be stored in one place and so you get a bunch of your servers having all your data and then your other servers are underused. Um, also, we like to use like these long descriptive names for, for things. We've taught that's a very good thing. Uh, HBase, you, usually they tell you not to because every name that you put in there is stored in every single record. So the idea is they actually suggest that you use short column families, short column name, or uh, column names, uh, 
also makes it difficult to work with. So I really do like HBase. I've been using it for a while. It's good for a lot of things, but I wouldn't recommend using it if you just want it to you know, host your latest web app. So lastly, just a few I think three slides left. Um, Hadoop in operations. Big issue is that it's still in its infancy. Um, it's changing a lot. There's not a lot of, uh, some of the best practices always haven't emerged. Complex configuration options. Uh, I think like 300 some different configuration options for the default Hadoop. Uh, confusion versioning, and I don't even want to go into this, but like, I think they just forgot how to you know, use normal numbers when they were versioning. It was just confusing to figure out which versions worked with which. And then you had to figure out, well, what version of Hadoop works with what version of HBase, works with what version of PIG. Um, and then on top of that is distributed systems are complex. So uh, there's plenty more issues where that came from, but those are the big ones. So I suggest using one of these. Uh, First time I tried using Hadoop, trying to kind of roll my own, didn't work. It's kind of like the people who, some people enjoy rolling their own distributions of Linux. Wouldn't recommend it unless you're really, really masochistic or you like that kind of thing. Uh, if you want to get started kind of on the cheap and easy, Amazon Elastic MapReduce is uh, a hosted version of MapReduce. I think it's based on MapR's version of, uh, of Hadoop. but that way, you can just spin up a few instances, do some processing, and there you are. Uh, right now, actually, I think uh, my experience has been mostly with Cloudera's distribution. Really good interface, pretty easy to install. Uh, you can run in a standalone VM as well that you can download from their site. I'm sure the other ones have similar things. but So if you want to get started really quick and easy with Hadoop, uh, I suggest either doing this or downloading the VM and it has everything pre-configured. Uh, it's not going to be optimal for production, but if you want to do production instances of this, uh, it's going to take a little while. And so those are my general tips. Use a distribution. Don't try to roll your own. Uh, monitor your cluster. And then uh, understanding how all this stuff works at a very basic level is very important just because when things go wrong, uh, it helps to understand what it's trying to do. So there's a lot of fundamental papers by, like I mentioned, Google on these issues, and helps you understand, you know, how is data stored in HBase? How does MapReduce, you know, move data? So it helps you avoid some things that can, uh, you know, when your cluster is running out of space, though you're only storing like half the data. Well, it could be because you're running a job that's creating a lot of intermediate sequence files, and that's what's filling it up. So as an example of something that happened to us recently. And conclusion. Um, Hadoop is great for working with big data, and I put cheap hardware, because if you're really going to build out your own like really large scale Hadoop cluster, uh, it's not going to be cheap. Uh, you're probably going to want to have high-end stuff for your master nodes and things like that. And it's going to be a lot of engineering effort. Um, but if you're wanting to run like a smaller scale one, it's probably not as bad. Uh, maybe that's where you consider something like Amazon. And all this power comes at the cost of complexity and loss of sleep and loss of hair, in my case. So that's really my conclusion.